Um, dear Professor Matam Duel, I guess we may start. Yes. Thank you, Begum. Um, dear guests, distinguished guests, welcome to the Symposium on Modern Interiors in Turkey 2. Keynote, Penis Park, Nature and the Modern Interior, Plants and Flowers Inside Session. Please make sure that your microphones and cameras are turned off during the session. You may comment and ask questions at the end of the session by raising hands or writing in the chat box. Now I give the word to our moderator, Professor Matt Amgurat. Matt Amgurat. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone to the first keynote speech of the symposium on modern interiors in Turkey. I am honored and very excited to introduce our keynote speaker today, Professor Penny Spark, a very valuable and immensely inspiring colleague and scholar. I feel that she's an excellent scholar to address our audience here uh, because of her great contribution to the history of modern interiors. Um, she's a prolific writer in this field with a very impressive body of work. I had the opportunity to meet Penny many years ago at their Doric House annual conference organized by the Modern Interiors Research Center, which she directs. I was then, and I am still very impressed with her work. To be fair to her accomplishments, I would like to read her short uh, bio. Penny Spark is a professor of design history at Kingston University and the director of the Modern Interiors Research Center. She studied French literature at the University of Sussex from 1967 uh, to 1971 and between 1972 and 1975 undertook research for her PhD in the history of design at Brighton Polytechnic. She subsequently developed uh, courses in and taught the history of design to undergraduate and postgraduate students at Brighton Polytechnic and the Royal College of Art. From 1999 to 2005, uh, she was Dean of the Faculty of Art, Design and Music at Kingston University. And from 2005 to 2014, she was prof uh, Vice uh, Chancellor. She has also participated in conferences, uh, given keynote addresses, been a member of journal editorial boards, curated exhibitions, delivered uh, visiting lectures, broadcast and published in the field of design history, both nationally and internationally. She has also supervised and examined many PhD in her subject. Her most important publications include an introduction to design and culture 1900 to the present first published in 1986 and then again in 2004 design in context published in 1987 electrical appliances published in 1988 italian design from uh, 19, uh, 1860 to the present in uh, 19 uh, 89, the plastics age in 1990, as long as, long as it's pink, uh, the sexual politics of taste. Uh, this is published in 1995. And I have to mention that this is one of my all time favorite reads, highly recommended. If you did not get a chance to read it, um, you may want to do so uh, very soon. She also authored Elsie de Wolf, The Birth of Modern Interior Decoration in 2005, The Modern Interior in uh, 2008, and Nature Inside, Plants and Flowers in the Modern Interior, uh, very recently, only in uh, two, uh, 2021. I am out of breath even reading this list of scholarly work. I don't know how you are so productive, Penny. Maybe you can also give us tips on that. Um, and today's talk is titled Nature and the Modern Interior, Plants and Flowers Inside. Uh, thank you, Penny, for accepting our invitation 
and being with us. The floor is yours. Um, I think your microphone. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Fine, I'm here now. So are you showing the recording? Hello, I'm Penny Spark. Yeah. I'm going to be giving a lecture today entitled Nature and the Modern Interior, Plants and Flowers Inside. First of all, I'm going to share my screen with you. So thank you very much for the invitation to talk today. I've been working this area for several years and I would like to take this opportunity to share some of my work and ideas with you. The research manifested itself in my 2021 publication, Nature Inside, Plants and Flowers in the Modern Interior. The book was organized chronologically, beginning with the plant hunters of the colonial era, and you can see Ham Sloan, who was, amongst other things, a plant hunter, and ending with today's millennials, for whom living among plants had become, or has become, commonplace. And you can see on the right, a, a very keen millennial watering her plants. My aim was to expand the subject of interiors beyond the cultural discussion that has dominated its study to date, by engaging with some ideas linked to the roles and meanings of nature that have emerged from the areas of ecology and environmentalism and which inform today's debate about climate change. While it may seem that these are very distant from our discussions about interiors, I would like to suggest that there are some interesting crossovers that can take the study of interiors into new directions. Perhaps my most interesting discovery when I was writing the book was the circularity of ideas that existed in relation to plants and flowers in interior spaces from the 19th century, such as you can see on the left in this slide, to the present, which you can see on the right. While the book presents a linear route through this narrative, it quickly became very clear that a commonality exists between ideas being expressed today and ones that were being formulated in the mid 19th century, Western industrialized, urbanized world. Those ideas centered on two key themes. Firstly, and most importantly, that albeit on a smaller scale, indoor nature can have the same effect on our state of mind as can outdoor nature. That is, it can calm us and improve what we now widely call our well being. Much is being written today, both in the popular press and in more scientific studies. As, for example, the author of a recent article in House and Garden magazine explained, and I'll just read a, a short section from that article to, to make my point. In the 1980s, the biologist E. O. Wilson co coined the term biophilia to refer to the ways that humans need and seek out connections with nature. And studies have found that elements of the natural world, or even reminders of them, have a positive effect on mental and physical health. The concept is gaining ground among architects and interior designers and the principles of biophilic design center on the incorporation of daylight, free flowing air, organic materials, plants, even wildlife into houses and workspaces. So even this is being acknowledged in the popular press. Now this journalistic piece, which is what it is, builds on earlier scientific studies that were undertaken by environmental psychologists and others. For example, in 1978, the pioneer American plantscaper, a man called Everett Conklin, published an essay entitled 
Interior Landscaping in the Journal of Arboriculture, in which he expressed his heartfelt belief that, quote, man is inherently unhappy in an environment in which there is an absence of plants and flowers. Six years later, the idea was picked up again by the biologist Edward O. Wilson, who, who was just, if you remember, it was just mentioned in the House and Guard article I just quoted from, with the publication of his book, Biphilia, which you can see slightly out of focus, a small version of there. In his book, like Conklin before him, Wilson articulated an evolutionary approach towards the concept of biophilia, which he defined as, quote, the innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes. So slightly different um, definitions each time, but they're all around the same idea. Later in the book, he admitted that we only think we have control over nature revealing himself to be one of the first in the field to recognize the importance of the agency of the natural world. And going with that, the need for human beings to relinquish their control over it and to reestablish a balanced relationship with it, which is an absolutely key belief today. So he was very early in that recognition, I think. Referencing the work of the American historian of technology, Leo Marx, Wilson regretted the fact that humankind had followed the path of the machine, which he felt had driven a wedge between nature and culture and initiated man's destruction of the former, which is a theme that we're, we're very um, familiar with today. He went as far as to say this, he said, man's domination over nature is, quote, like burning a Renaissance painting to cook dinner. That's how strongly. Uh, he felt about it at that time. Now, although biophilia, it was suggested um, by Wilson and others, was rooted in learning that had taken place in the past, they felt that it continued to exist in people who had lived in urban environments for several generations. That is, the memory of it stays within us and, and affects how we feel. That implied that the satisfaction of that craving led to a state of psychological well-being, a reduction in stress levels, and the promotion of physical health. So these ideas were put in place in the, in the sort of mid-1980s and, and developed um, from them. A little later, a group of psychologists undertook an experiment with plants in an office setting. And here you can see two images, 1970s image of, of plants in interiors, in office interiors specifically, were, which were believed to have a, a wonderful effect. The psychologists working on this said that based on the results they found, they reached the conclusion that there is a link between job satisfaction and plants and in interior office design. And this was a very widespread belief and, and remains so to some extent. Through the final two decades of the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st century, many other researchers from a wide range of related disciplines have reached similar conclusions. So it's, it's got bigger and bigger and bigger. A number of scientists measured pulses, heartbeats, blood pressure, muscle contractions, and undertook brain scans in their attempts to provide scientific evidence of human beings' positive responses to nature both inside and outside buildings. So although in the Victorian period, this was all very intuitive, by the time we get to the 21st century, it's, it needs to be proven scientifically. The links between physical health and indoor plants were confirmed in 2009, for example, when Song Hin Park and Richard H. Matson tested the medical and psychological effects of plants and flowers that had been introduced into the hospital rooms of post-operative female patients, so taking it actually into the hospital. They published their results in an article entitled Therapeutic Influences of Plants in Hospital Rooms on Surgical Recovery. According to these researchers, the patients with plants in their rooms had, quote, shorter hospitalizations, less need for analgesics, lower ratings of pain, anxiety and fatigue, 
and more positive feelings compared, that is, with those who didn't have plants in their rooms. The work claimed to prove what the Victorians, as I've already suggested, knew intuitively that um, flowers in hospital wards or plants particularly had a beneficial effect. And you can here, see here two images of um, the way in which the Victorians were very happy to put plants into hospital wards on the left, even within a, a quite large um, terraria. So something we don't do now, but something they believed was beneficial and which researchers more, most recently have believed beneficial as well. There exists today, therefore, as indeed there had existed in the Victorian era, era, a belief in the power of indoor plants to dispel anxiety. Back in 19th century Europe, and I'm moving back and forward from the from Victorian period to the present to, to try and make my point. So back in the 19th century in Britain, Europe and the USA, the anxiety that needed to, do was to be dispelled by bringing plants inside was that which had been caused by the loss of in nature, loss of nature incurred by urbanization and people leaving their lives in the countryside in large numbers. So the very fact that people were leaving their connection with nature and moving into towns and cities created an anxiety and the bringing of plants inside was intended largely to dispel that. The writers of advice books in the practice of what was called at the time window gardening were very clear about the potentially beneficial psychological role of indoor plants. Shirley Hibbert, for example, writing in his 1856 book, Rustic Adornments for Homes of Taste, explained that nature inside was, he believed, a source of rest, solace and refreshment. And the American advice book writer, Henry T. Williams, was very much of the same mind. And he believed indoor plants and flowers to be, quote, soul refreshing, heart inspiring and eye brightening. Very nice language that they used. And he went as far as to claim that they took the place, plants indoors that is, took the place of a dead child for bereaved parents, amused invalids and calmed children at school. So he, he really did believe that they had an enormous effect. The Victorians clearly understood the comfort that came from being reunited with nature in its tamed, domesticated form. They also appreciated the close, emotionally charged relationship believed to exist between humans and plants based on the fact that they were both living organisms. Now, much has been written about the subtle language of the interiors of the 19th century urban and suburban middle class interior and the home in general emphasizing really the way in which its decor expressed its inhabitants' adherence to the fast-moving fashion system. So that's quite widely documented in several books. But less documented is the fact that plants and flowers played an important part within that. Although plucked from the natural world, they rapidly became near cultural artifacts in the domestic context. Extensions of the furniture and furnishings within it and significant markers of the level of aesthetic knowledge or taste in that setting. I'm just going to show you a few slides um, showing the kinds of ways in which plants were used indoors. And there you can see the front, the cover of Hibbard's Rustic Adornments for Homes of Taste. And on the right, um, a set of flowers set into a window, a bay window. Hanging baskets were very common, plants on balconies, both of these images from Hibbard. Another um, very favored object, a fern case that's combined with an aquarium, again, illustrated in Hibbert, and you've got two, two versions of that. And here two other examples of Victorian ladies now with their indoor plants. On the left, um, an image of a lady tending her window box, and on the right, an ivy trailed across the window, which was a very common phenomenon. And to show you some ferns, ferns were very popular. And on the left, there's an image of a very large fern in a Edwardian dining room. And on the right, smaller palms um, set in an interior in Liverpool um, in the house of Samuel J. Waring. Now, in addition to the accounts about indoor plants pro uh, providing calm settings and relieving anxiety, there is also a considerable amount of discussion today 
coming back to the present, about the way in which plants can remove toxins from the air in an indoor setting. Now, complementing the work on the effects of indoor plants on human beings' health and well-being, the effects of indoor plants on air pollution was also widely addressed from the 1970s right up to the present. And the subject came to a head in the wake of a 1989 publication of a report by Bill Will Wolverton, who by that time had been a senior research scientist at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi for 18 years. Now, Wolverton is a very key figure in this discussion around plants and pollution and toxins. Back in 1973, NASA had discovered that Skylab 3 had been contaminated with more than 300 volatile organic chemicals or VOCs as we now call them. And Wolverton had been called in to investigate the problem. Sorry, one last image of a Edwardian parlor full of ferns. And this is a publication by Wolverton from 1996. By the early 1980s, Wolverton was renowned for describing plants as the lungs of the earth. He had discovered that certain plants, areca palms, lady palms, ficus alii, and the golden pothos among them, were more effective air purifiers than others. So all plants have some effect, but some have more than others. In 1984, he published some of his early research and three years later, he and his team, research team, set out on a two-year project jointly funded by NASA and the Associated Landscape Contractors of America to evaluate the ability of 12 common houseplants to remove chemicals from sealed units. So again, it, it was dealt with very scientifically. Wolverton's 1989 report on the use of interior landscape plants for indoor air pollution abatement based on the project I've just mentioned, was published by NASA, and it became very influential. It began by outlining sick building syndrome in general, and went on to focus on the air pollution problems that NASA had identified in sealed space habitats. There were three main toxins um, that needed to be eliminated, according to the report. These were benzene, trichloroethylene, and formaldehyde. And it becomes, you know, obviously very scientific and technical at this point. And the decision to use plants and soil to remove them from the environment seemed obvious to Wolverton. And he says this in this report. Since man's existence on Earth depends upon a life support system involving an intricate relationship with plants and their associated microorganisms, it should be obvious that when he attempts to isolate himself in tightly sealed buildings away from this ecological system, problems will arise. So he was, his work was hugely influential. Now, going back again to the 19th century, this back and forward movement, the links between indoor plants and toxin removal were also already known about and understood back in the 19th century. And I'm quoting, here, um, there are several quotes I could give you, but this one is from an 1897 book entitled The Principles and Practice of the Modern House. And in that book, you can find this statement. Indoor plants preserve the purity of the air by removing the poisonous gas evolved by animals and the combustion of hydrocarbons and maintain the equilibrium of nature. So there's nothing new under the sun in this area. It's all been thought about to a certain extent in the 19th century and everything from around 1970 onwards really is revisiting a number of those, those findings. However, and this is rather important for my book, although these ideas were discussed in the 19th century, they disappeared after that only to reemerge in the 1970s and to become more widespread in the early 21st century. This inevitably leads one to ask, why was this the case? Why was this gap between about 1900 and 1970? Now, whether, as in the Victorian era, as a result of rapid urbanization, or in the 20th century, or the late 20th century, because human beings had believed so strongly of the power of technology to improve their lives, both eras experienced the loss of a connection with 
and excessive control over the natural world. So what I'm saying is uh, the 19th century lost that control by moving to the cities. Maybe the power of the machine and, and the importance of technology in the 20, in the, in the most of the 20th century has meant that there was a reaction against it in the late 20th century and early 21st, so that you get a repetition of the same sort of thing that happened in the Victorian era. For a variety of reasons also, both periods, 19th century, 70s onwards, have experienced widespread anxiety and instability and understood the power of therapeutic environments to calm people. The psychological and sensorial roles that interiors can play and their effects on human beings, I would like to suggest were very important to both eras and perhaps slightly lost in the period between. But of course that's, that's up for grabs because that's the next question that I have to ask. What, you know, what did happen in this period, 1900, 1970? Did plants go away? Did the understanding of their role go away? And exactly what happened? Now, what I discovered through my research is that it's not to say that health and well-being weren't equally important to the creators and inhabitants of interiors created in that period, 1970. So um, what I'm saying, and I say in the book, is that they were important, but there, is, there are important differences. The dominant discourse of that era in broad terms, and I'm having to generalize here, of course, was dominated by technologically driven modernism and a commitment to social improvement that went with that. The focus was on the issue of collective health rather than that of individuals in their home, which had been much more what the Victorians had thought about, where plants and flowers were concerned. In that modernist period, and I'm going to call it modernism, late modernism, priority was given to the importance of light and air and of nature in the abstract rather than in the living sense. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So I was led to ask, whether the designers of modernist interiors use plants and flowers in their indoor spaces. And it was a question that drove much of the research that underpinned the middle sections of my book. So I start with the Victorian period, I end with the post 1970s, but the bulk of the middle deals with this question of what happened within modernism and late modernism. What I wanted to know was whether the close alignment that had existed in the 19th century between nature and the interior, between that is nature and culture, continued in the 20th century, and if so, why and how? Interestingly, what I discovered was that although it wasn't documented at the time, and this is key, or later, plants and flowers did continue to be present in the interior spaces of many of the buildings designed by European and American modernist and late modernist architects. And that key about it not being having documented is really the point because the Victorians documented it um, intensively and post 1970 has been documented widely as well. But it just really kind of went away as a subject of, of discussion in that inter interim period. However, the role in this interim period of plants and flowers was modified. Different plants were used and they were introduced for different reasons and in different ways. Most significantly, their links to well being were less obvious than the ways in which they were used to realize modernist aesthetic and spatial agendas and to offset what could sometimes be seen as the excessively hard appearance of modern materials, things like steel, glass, and concrete in modern architecture in particular. So they're there, the plants and flowers, but they seem to have a slightly different agenda. And it's primarily aesthetic, spatial, and this offsetting of a sort of otherwise over hard aesthetic. Now, as I've said, the relationship that existed between modernist architecture and nature was expressed in general terms for the most part. We don't get this very specific discussion around certain plants and the way in which they affect the interior. Nature and architecture were seen to go together, but the emphasis was, for example, on the relationship of a building with its site. I'm just giving you one example here of a, a modernist building very specifically set right next to the sea in a Mediterranean setting or in the context of the organic 
or interpretation of modernism that diverged from the more geometric aesthetic that took the idea of the machine and mass production as a starting point on the use of nature as an inspiration for a particular kind of formal abstraction. So um, importantly, the concept of enclosed interiority that had been embraced in the 19th century, and that's epitomized by this picture of a woman in a party, you just see her sitting at her table in the background there, a very, very enclosed interior. That was replaced by an idea of spatial continuity between inside and outside, and I'm giving you an image of um, Walter Gropius's master's house in Dessau, where the balconies and the flat roof and the verandas show that continuity between inside and outside, which you certainly don't get on the left. In fact, you can see the curtains closed and the outside shut out. So we're dealing with very different concepts of the interior in these, in these periods. There's, a, there's a sh in fact, an overt rejection of the former by the latter. In turn, a commitment to dwelling rooted in a rational understanding of the use of indoor spaces replaced the earlier, more sensorial notion of comfortable domesticity. And the plants and flowers that were used then were used instrumentally. And I'm just showing you two images here of modernist uses of cacti, so different plants. Cacti were around in the Victorian period, but they were not used in quite the same way. Here they're set up in rows, first of all in Owen Piscata apartment by Breuer, and you can see that lovely little row of cacti. And interestingly, we usually only see the, the left element of that interior. We don't often see that one with the cacti. And on the right, um, the electric house in Monza with that wonderful row of cacti between two layers of, of glass at the front of the building. So we've got plants being used, but rather differently. Arguably then, plants and flowers were used in many of the interior spaces of modernist buildings to create a new language of domesticity, but it is a new domesticity. It's not the Victorian domesticity. It's a modern one in which indoors and outdoors are permeable, continuous, and in which um, plants are used as much more sort of um, rigorous way, not rigorous, but sort of hard way, let's put it that way. Here's two more examples of modernist use of nature. Interestingly, both of them conservatories, the Villa Schminka and uh, Agropius House. Both of them have got contained conservatories with, with glazed exteriors holding and containing those plants, not allowing them to get out into the wild, uh, which you would have found much more in a Victorian interior. I think nowhere was this more apparent than in Mies van der Rohe's Villa Tugendhat in Brno, which I use as a case study of one of my chapters, where in spite of his pioneering use of the open plan, the openness to the space outside and the technological innovation that largely defined that building, plants and flowers helped to inject a high level of livability into it. And that uh, was in two ways, really. On the on one hand, there was a, this conservatory, a wonderful conservatory, which you can, if you look at the right hand side of the building on the left, the little glass front is the front of the conservatory, and on the right, we're inside the conservatory. So there were plants in the conservatory, rather as we just saw in the last slide, a contained nature. But there were also plants spread throughout the house in different places, used for different reasons, mostly spatial, but also to create some kind of domesticity. So. Plants are in modernism, but they're there. We're not getting that well-being sense. We're getting much more aesthetic and much more spatial sense. Now, following the Second World War, when the modernist agenda took root on American soil, a reconciliation between modern interiors and nature quickly emerged in many private and public buildings. So while in the 20s and 30s, it's there, but it's kind of held back and we don't read anything about it at all. When we get to um, this American late modernism, it's, it's much more apparent. When European architectural modernism spread to the USA's West Coast in the 20s, for example, it encountered a year round, warm, dry climate and lush vegetation. So a very different setting from the sort of cold winters of Europe. While its program of social utopianism 
and its alignment with cultural and technological modernity rate stayed in place, modernism was, was used rather differently. And many of the private residences that were created in that new setting were transformed by their nature encounter, but in a rather different way. Now, given the possibility in California, where we're now located, of not merely being able to look at nature outside through plate glass windows, as, as you could in Mises' house, but of actually living outside, and in so doing, taking the inside outside, nature inside took on a new meaning. So I'm going to just look at a couple examples very quickly of, of that new inside outside existence and very familiar images of case study um, house number eight by the Eameses, uh, photographed um, by Sh um, Shulman. Okay, now case study house eight, which you'll which all be very familiar, which was designed by the Eameses as their own home, completed in 1949, demonstrated a close relationship with nature on several levels. A link between nature outside, and you can see this row of trees on the left, and nearly inside the Eames's house was made by the addition of a row of small pots of plants and flowers positioned just outside the building next to its glass wall. You can just see those plants in the very, almost in the middle of that image on the left. Over the years, the pots grew in number. Gradually, gardens appeared at the front of the main house and in the space between it and the studio. So outside, there was a proliferation of plants. And Geraniums had a fairly constant presence. However, a 1950 Schulman image, which we see on the right, um, shows a small potted geranium being included in the interior of the house. You can see that to the bottom right there. It's carefully positioned on the floor near a bonquette located in an alcove. So I would suggest it's used spatially to, to, to um, almost as a kind of screen. And as you can see in that image, it's accompanied by a large rubber plant that marks the end of the bonquette and a partly visible Swiss cheese plant that was used to phrase the image. So Shulman's using plants to frame his images, but also the Eameses are using those plants to create spatial, spatial shifts or spatial changes in is what's otherwise an open plant space. So very strategically being used here. The West Coast modernists also brought the outside inside by planting nature into soil in the floor of inside buildings, thereby seemingly recreating natural areas of the sites that had existed before the buildings had obliterated them. And you can see here in Soriano's case study house, um, 1950, that's exactly what's happening. And the architect plants these, these into an internal square bed situated between an opening and the ceiling. So you're replacing the nature that you've actually destroyed by building the building. So neither fully inside nor outside, these plants serve to reinforce the sense of ambiguity and contradiction that defined so many of the houses created at that time. So various strategies used in different ways. Now this new model of modern domesticity that emerged in post-war California which was offering people an inside outside experience was quickly emulated across the USA, especially in the new residential suburbs where alongside bulbous automobiles and refrigerators, it became a component of the American dream. Now in contrast through the 1960s, many American urban centers witnessed the emergence of many large scale late modernist, late modernist developments, often high rise, constructed to meet the growing needs of commerce, leisure and work. So we shift from now from the, um, in this context, from the, the domestic to the, to the um, public spaces. Now, although not domestic in nature, those buildings also embraced indoor planting schemes introduced to humanize their otherwise harsh and impersonal spaces. And I'm going to just quickly look at three examples of American plant filled interiors in late modernist commercial and corporate architectural structures. And those three buildings, the interiors, are New York's uh, Four Seasons restaurant of 1959, Dallas's North Park Center, shopping center of 1965, and New York's Ford Foundation office complex completed in 1968. Now, where the first was concerned, 
a decision was made to add four trees at the corners of a pool, as well as some potted plants suspended from a horizontal rail that spanned the floor to ceiling windows on one side of the room. And you can see those four trees and you can see the plants and the windows in that image there. The trees were planted in large round pots with flowers growing in them at low level. As the room had 24, at 24 um, foot high ceilings, 17 foot high trees were used to make the necessary visual impact and to fit with the scale. So these are enormous trees. Originally, four fig trees were introduced and later azaleas and birch trees were used in the spring. Philodendrons and cocos palmosa, that's palm trees in the summer, burnt orange and yellow chrysanthemums and oak leaf branches in the autumn and white chrysanthemums and white birch trees in the winter. And that changed over the life of the restaurant. So there's a constant sense of seasonal change. And I think that's one thing that nature does um, in, in otherwise spaces that are shut off from nature and the, the changing seasons. It brings back that sense of movement and, and through time and through the seasons. Now Dallas's shopping mall, known as the North Park Center, which opened in 65, employed similar strategies, but aimed them at a larger section of the public. This is much more open than the Four Seasons. While the restaurant was promoting a new eating experience, the Dallas Mall set out to create a new modern retail experience that com combined shopping with leisure, pleasure, and social activity. From the outset, the large central area of the mall was filled with potted plants and benches to sit on. The former were arranged in highly stylized modern manner, as you can see in these images here, and sat along contemporary art pieces, pieces of sculpture. The use of the polished concrete on the mall floor added to the dramatic visual effect of the plants. You can see that particularly on the right. And they were embedded in a variety of circular, square and rectangular planters arranged in regular groupings, which again, you can see there. Most of them were wide and low, the pots that is, to allow the plants and flowers they contained to be visible from a higher level in the mall. So you could go up and look down on them, which in fact I did to take this image here. Much attention was given to the geometric shapes of the clusters of potted plants, and each one provided a large block of unified color and texture as if it were a large painting. There was a strong artistic and architectural flavor to these arrangements. In addition to their position in the center of the pedestrian, pedestrianized area, plants were also used throughout the mall to function as space dividers, barriers and screens. So they're very strategic, but first of all, they're art, they're kind of artistic. And as at the Four Seasons, these plantings were changed four times annually. Now, plants were added on the third, fourth, and fifth floors of the garden of the New York's Ford Foundation office complex. Nearly 40 trees, a thousand shrubs, and over 22,000 vines and ground cover plants were installed. The aim in the early years was to use a range of temperate plants and eight 25 to 35 foot high magnolia trees were brought from Richmond, Virginia to form the core of the garden. And you can see some of these plantings here on the left from sort of looking down from the top and from the right looking across. Jacaranda trees, an evergreen pear, a red iron bank and a Japanese cryptomeria were also planted there, as were several camellias and six variety of azaleas amongst other plants and flowers. Ornamental ferns and grasses were also used extensively. Um, and there you can see right at the bottom, there was a, a pond. The um, flowers in the planters were changed seasonally. Again, this is something in common with this, this period. And the lighting, irrigation and drainage were carefully calculated. The architectural critic Ada Louise Huxtable described the garden as a horticultural spectacular and probably one of the most romantic environments ever devised by a corporate man. So really, really enjoyed this interior. In conclusion then, to put my talk together, although they've received very little serious discussion until now, we can see that plants and flowers were introduced 
into many modernist and late modernist indoor spaces. However, this is where I sort of have a caveat, I think, this period being rather different from the one before it and after it. They were mostly used in this 1900-1970 period by architects and designers in a controlling way to further their aesthetic and spatial intentions with little thought given to the bigger issue about the unequal relationship that existed between human beings and the natural world. They're very much in control of these plants. Interestingly, as we heard at the beginning of this talk, that awareness was first expressed by the specialist plantscapers who came to the fore in the 1960s and who became increasingly influential in subsequent decades right up to the present. Today, the term biophilia is widely referenced and there is a growing awareness of the role of nature in indoor therapeutic environments. So we're very aware of it now. And there is a growing understanding of the need to heal the rift between human beings and nature in a way that sees them both as capable of exerting agency. That's really important. It's an awareness the Victorians fully understood two centuries ago. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Penny, uh, for that um, very inspiring talk, very informative. And um, I'm sure there will be some questions. So I would like to take the questions uh, right now. If we have any questions in the audience, you can raise your hand or you can uh, write in the chat box. And I know Özge, uh, Özge is helping us with that. So wonderful. Sure, hocam. Uh, ee, Türkçe sorusu olanlar varsa onları da alabiliriz değerli katılımcılarımızdan e, çeviri yapmamız mümkün her şekilde. Great. I think we have a question from Deniz Hasırcı. So Deniz, please go ahead. Thank you, hocam. Uh, thank you, uh, professor. That that was a very interesting talk and it was very informative. Um, I have a question about, uh, I mean, we know that biofilic design is an important issue and it's uh, e even uh, incredibly important now as we go through the pandemic uh, period, of course. I was wondering if you could elaborate on um, the variations of biophilic tendencies in modern interior design around the world in different geographies um, in one category, perhaps, but then also in other as other natural elements such as mountains, water elements, circadian rhythms. There's studies on sound and uh, rhythms of other natural patterns, but also abstractions of nature as well. So I was um, curious about um, what you think about that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. It's a big question. Um, I suppose the first thing to say is that my focus is on interior plants because nature and the environment is, is, is a vast subject. So I, I kept away from nature outside, except when I felt that the values that we put on nature outside were coming into the home. So my focus is very much um, on the inside. Um, but as you say, um, it's a global phenomenon today, certainly. Um, it's very much part of our current awareness. As you say, during COVID, we've become more and more aware of it. And I, I would say that it's, it's part of industrialized society and post-industrialized society. Um, but of course, that's, that's spread globally now. So it, it's, it's there. But I, I don't really want to comment about other forms of nature, really, because I think it's such a big subject. Um, but of course, the same values are there. They, they have the, the effect of, nature has the effect of calming us. And that's whether we walk in a forest or whether we bring a small cactus into our home. I think the, the point is it's the same. And of course, many people live in very, very small houses. They don't have gardens. They don't even have balconies. So collecting plants and bringing them inside is a very important activity for lots of people today. But it, it's a, perhaps not a substitute for walking in mountains and going through forests, but it, it's a representation of that broader thing, I think. Thank you so much. 
You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, with the pandemic, it's a it's a big subject right now again. So it's a very timely uh, research, I think. Also, any any other uh, questions from the audience? May I? <laughs> yes. Um, we we have questions. We don't uh, please uh, first in the chat box. We have questions. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, in the chat. Yes. So, Haluk Zelef, I guess, right? So I'm trying to, yeah. Uh, there's a question by Haluk Zelef. Modernists were also very much interested in the far Esat garden, understanding our gardens, such as Zen gardens, rock gardens, which are more focused on the non-living items. I guess this is a comment from Haluk. Uh, thank you. And, there is another one, let's see. As early as 1970s, Friotto in his eco house in a warm brown used plants to enrich the interior, being part of the garden and air quality inside the superstructure built like a glass house. The superstructures allows a air volume of three times of the rooms adding to a bungalow type. So uh, this is also a comment, uh, I guess, but maybe uh, uh, Penny would like to comment on these comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're very interesting, both of them. Um, and that example, the Harioto example is, is a great one. I mean, there are many that one could reference, um, but I think that modernist use of plants inside, I think that's one of the points I was trying to make. It is, very spatial and very formal and very aesthetic. And I think there is well-being in there as well, but it's very um, little articulated. When we get to 1970, it's much more obvious, really, and, it, and we're beginning to move into a more environmentally aware era. And there is much more discussion about the, the way plants do um, change our psychology. But in that earlier period, particularly to the 20s and 30s and into the 50s to some extent, it's much more spatial and much more aesthetic. But that's a very interesting example of when you're getting into a, a later period and it is taking on that more environmental implications. Great. Özge, you had a question? Oh, well, we have another one here by Nina Toleva. Can any relation between the modernist movement and the urban agricultural practices be found? I mean, in terms of utilitarian plants, not just decorative ones. In the Balkans, Bulgaria, Turkey, etc., the urban domestic yard was a symbol of high status and most of the plants and trees used had utilitarian functions, vines, herbs, etc. How this, uh, uh, changed later. That's a very interesting point that, of course, we don't just have plants for decorative. Well, in fact, plants in their very origins, and I begin in the 18th century in the book, they mostly have a function. They're herbal. Um, you know, it's either for, for health or for, for food or all sorts of range of functional utilitarian things. And the decoration comes in a bit later, actually. It doesn't come in really till the wealthy start um, taking plants from the colonies and putting them into their into their um, onto their gardens, but also into their houses. So I think that utilitarian thing, particularly in a, a rural setting, but increasingly, obviously, in an urban setting, is always there. Um, I fo didn't focus on it so much in the, in the 20th century. I'd, I'd moved towards the more decorative, but I think it's always been there. Um, and I think today it's there very strongly that people are now built uh, using using plants in, in a functional way for food or whatever, and that's can be inside with hydroponic um, ways of growing veg growing things without water, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, it's, a, it's a strand that's always been there and continues. It's not one I focused on in great depth, but I, I fully understand that it's there, yes. Great. And yeah, they thank you very much. Now, Özge, uh, maybe we can take your question yeah um i was wondering uh, professor spark you mentioned um the the use of plants in modern times um, um 
saying that the architects uh, and the designers use them usually to offset the hard surfaces of the modern spaces and the man is always in control of the plants. They are not concerned about the plants themselves, the nature. So uh, the plants have an aesthetic uh, role in that uh, modern and uh, super modern times, let's say. And as opposed to that, uh, Victorians are more concerned about the wellness uh, that the plants can provide. Uh, but I'm also thinking about the cabinet of uh, curiosities and um, uh, other sorts of collecting and uh, controlling plants uh, at that time as well. Don't you think there's a, a similar drive in that uh, attitude uh, too? Yeah, that's a very good point. I think we've always had control over plants for whatever purpose we brought them inside. And you're right that the Victorians did understand the well-being, but that didn't mean they weren't controlling. They were extremely controlling, um, particularly in the way they used them within the interior decoration um, and the way in which they set, set them in the home, et cetera, et cetera. It's not really till we get right up in the 21st century that we start thinking perhaps perhaps we're not in control. I think it's, I, I mentioned one quote from, I think it was from Anis Conklin, who said that we think we're in control, but we're not really. And that's quite a late development. I, well, but maybe the sort of 1990s, but certainly into the 21st century. Um, we've only just realizing it now. And even now we don't quite know how to relinquish control. I think it's quite a difficult thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're getting questions here in the chat box and one from Sergio, uh, one of our colleagues. Would you consider indoor planting and all related studies about the usage of nature in interior design as an essential discipline for today's interior architecture education? And he thanks a lot for your inspiring lecture. Thank you. Uh, that's a really good question. And I think the answer is yes. I mean, there is a, a a new professional um, who developed really in the late 20th century, who was called either the interior scaper, the plant scaper, sometimes the interior plant scaper. There's a particularly emerging in America with all those very large atriums and things that had to be filled. It's, it's a big business. It's large quantities of plants. It's, it's a lot of money involved, a lot of maintenance involved, a lot of technical um, knowledge needed to maintain plants in those large spaces. So it's a very highly skilled, highly, highly monetized and highly um, technical arena. I, I think it's, a, it's perhaps not at the core of interior architecture as a training, but it's certainly at the edges of it. And I think it's a specialism within interior architecture. It's interior scaping, if you like, could well be a, a specialist strand within interior architecture. It's, it's certainly much needed. And you think of the large scale um, developments that are happening today, whether, you know, in Asia, um, or Europe or America indeed, then, then skilled people are needed to actually implement those schemes. Great, thank you. We have another question from Emine. Uh, she says, thank you so much for the presentation. I recall Pimlet's reference to creating gardens as part of interiorization process by Mimic the Heaven recalling Frick Collection Museum and interiors also in a similar way. However, I'm wondering how you elaborate post-World War II period and metabolist perspective into interior decoration and use of plant indoors? That's a really good question too. The metabolists, um, well, they were part of, of they, they were using, they were using greenery certainly within their their work. I, I didn't focus on them. Um, it's a very big subject and I'm afraid I started in the 18th century and came to the present, which was a little bit dangerous because it's such a long, long period. Um, and I could have given many more examples, obviously, but that's a good um, example of another arena. Um, I suppose I, my main emphasis was to try and try and step back from it, to, to, to use case studies to um, elaborate, for example, Villa Tugendhat and then those American examples to try and represent some broader tendencies and, and to try and understand how the, the agenda shifted over that large period. Wonderful, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we have questions from YouTube. Oh, Uzge, can you just tell us? 
sorry, hocam. I think we have additional questions here as well. Okay. Uh, first. By Fison, oh. or I'll, I'll read that one. Okay. Thank you very much for this lovely presentation. Plant pests are a big problem while growing plants and flowers. I lost most of them and do not want to use pesticide. Is there any possibility cohabitation or coexistence between them? How this problem was solved in Victorian era? Hmm. Yes, yes. I may have given the impression that it's very easy to grow indoor plants, and it's certainly not. It's very complicated. Um, I, th I think the way I think about it is, I mean, I think many of us have dead plants in our homes. I certainly have them, and there's nothing worse than a dead plant. A plant is all about life, so we have to maintain them. Um, but it's difficult. I think the way I think about it is the fact that people commit so much energy and time and thought to actually maintaining plants means that they mean an awful lot to them. Um, it, it's a sign, really, of, of the fact that we do realize that we're investing emotions and um, caring to them. We're nurturing them in the way we are pets or children even. So there's, it, it is a complicated thing. It's not just, I mean, it's much easier to use inanimate decorations, which you just put on a shelf and leave them there. But then they're, they're dead. <laughs> and uh, of course, there are dead plants as well. And we'd have to know how to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe now we can get the other questions, Özge. Sure. Yeah. Um, we, we received questions from you too. Um, from Matt Andoan, she's asking, uh, hello, as an interior architect, what are the factors to be considered about the combination of landscape products and interior spaces? Yeah, landscape and interiors. Well, I suppose that the, one of the points I was trying to make is that there is this direct continuity between inside and outside, and that's what plants do. They bring the outside inside. So, and we talk now about interior landscaping, or as I mentioned before, plantscaping. So there is a direct line of connection, I think, between what we do outside and what we do inside. But of course, um, again, we have to think about whether people have space. Many people don't have space and they're only dealing with plants inside because they, they haven't got room outside. But yes, there's a direct connection between the two. Thank you. Thank you. Is good. Do we have any other? Uh, we don't have any other questions at the moment. Thank you. Okay. And I'm trying to see if there are any hands. And um, perhaps I may ask the last question if possible. Hello, Professor okay. Spark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I was just wondering, how do you evaluate the current interior plant applications in the name of biophilic design? compared to former modern approaches or Victorian approaches in interiors, um, especially thinking that we are mostly living in apartments nowadays, also like gated communities perhaps, because you were saying like uh, bringing plants inside is like combining outside and inside together. And um, do you find any similarities or differences compared to former periods? Yeah. Yes, that's one of the points I was. I hoped I made is that the, the Victorians didn't use the term biophilia, of course, but nonetheless, I think they understood it quite intuitively. And the, particularly those people who were writing about what they called window gardening, the, the emphasis was very, very much on the psychological benefits. Um, and I suppose we have to think that they'd only just left the countryside. The Victorians were the first generation, really, to come into the urban. So it was very very strong for them, that sense of loss. Um, I think perhaps we've lost that sense of loss today because we're so many generations on. Um, and I suppose biophilia has evolved as a kind of way of substituting um, the directness of the loss and saying that, you know, even though we don't remember living in the countryside, biophilia maintains that we do actually have a memory of it somewhere deep in us. And we all have that sense of loss. So, um, as I say, it got lost in the middle of the century when the preoccupations of the interior were just very different, very technologically focused. But I think we have swung back um, towards that, that understanding and brought it into the present. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we have another comment here. Uh, 
Let me see. Yeah. Thank you for this informative lecture. I was wondering how popular were cacti in modernist interiors. I find it consistent that cactus fits well in the modernist discourse, low maintenance, time efficient, and also streamlined in its form. Yeah, that's a very good comment. And, and uh, I showed a couple, but I could have shown a lot more. Um, cacti were very, very popular. Interestingly, they didn't suddenly become popular. They were popular in the Victorian period as well, but amongst many other things. But in the, in the modernist, certainly interwar period, they were very popular. I think also that that fitted in with a kind of a new interest in maybe the primitive and the, and the idea of the desert and, and that sort of escapism of, of going um, into the desert. And I'm thinking of um, D.H. Lawrence, that it, it comes through literature, it comes through painting, as well as through interiors, actually, they're interested in, in, um, in cacti and those kinds of plants. But it's a very important theme. And I think that point about low maintenance, visual um, synergy with the kind of interiors that you found in the modern period um, was very strong and they were very important, definitely. Great, thank you. And um, maybe I can ask the last question now that we covered the <laughs> lecture and the questions. I'm just curious, I know you wrote on Elsie the Wolf and uh, you have a book on that. And uh, she uh, called herself the first interior decorator and we now study her in our uh, interior um, uh, design courses. So I was, I'm wondering, in the, I'm thinking of the Colony Club, the airy atmosphere, maybe plants inside, it was green. So I, 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 it just made me think of her take. What do you think her take would be on this uh, discussion? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, she did use plants a lot, um, particularly in those, those big spaces like the Colony Club and on, on the roof garden, she has huge palms and things in there. But she also, and I, we haven't talked about that much today, but flowers are very important as well. And she also used flowers um, on mantelpieces and she only used white roses that was her only or lilies the two white flowers were the only ones she would use so she had very strict rules about how she used them but she certainly used them quite intensively yes okay well thank you penny spark so much um we really benefited uh, from this very inspiring lecture and it was wonderful to see you uh, on screen <laughs> and i'm wondering um if we can close the session or uh, I'm asking the team here. Okay. Uh, I think so. If we don't have any other questions and it seems so, we are uh, finished. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us for this session. Bye-bye now. <laughs>